Mm-hmm. I think there are different types of cultures, right? Within yeah. within uh, within society, right? You have mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know norms and behaviors for work, right? Mm-hmm. So you work can call culture. that like workplace culture, yeah. right? You have, I think, norms and behavior for um, how to be successful, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you might identify that as like hus- hustle culture, mm-hmm. right? Um, how do these Different cultures, right? Do they do they make it difficult? I wonder for you in in helping people to navigate through uh, their challenges, their mental health challenges, when you take into consideration what society the what society is placing on them, right? The mm-hmm. expectations that society is placing on them. How do you help them navigate through those expectations? Yeah. When I think of When I think of hustle culture, I think of the mentality that we, our generations um, were taught during slavery and how Mm -hmm. you just had to work through the pain. You know, whether you were sick, work through it, hustle through it. Uh, Whether you were pregnant, work through it, hustle through it. So whatever um, element or whatever condition you were dealing with at that time, you just had to hustle through it. Mm -hmm. And I think in our generation today, some of us still have that same hustle mentality that, oh, my mental is not where it needs to be, but I'm going to work through it. Um, my coping mechanisms and how I deal with things is not healthy, but I'm going to just work through it. Um, And that also brings the element of avoidance. So hustle culture is avoiding the elephant in the room and avoiding the conflict that you're experiencing um, to, to feel okay during that time. So I think, I think that hustle culture is unhealthy when you think about, really identifying the problem and dealing and managing with the the conflict at hand. Um, But it brings, it reminds me that African Americans as a group, we're very resilient. Hello, hello, and welcome everybody. Yeah, it's, it's, it's another episode of uh, Speaking with Gravity, Speaking with Gravity podcast. Uh, we are on episode six. Uh, so we're halfway through, y'all. We're halfway yes. through the season. We're not rushing it no. or nothing <laughs> like that now. But just letting y'all know, we're halfway through. Y'all been sticking with us halfway through this Thank journey you. of Thank this you. season. So give yourselves a, a quiet hand out there. A quiet, quiet hand. hand. <laughs> a quiet hand. Um, well, once again, you know, th- this uh, season... We have a uh, new host, new host. First time this group has come together. Uh, so just want to go through and introduce ourselves to you one more time. Reintroduce ourselves to you. Again, I'm Joshua um, uh, with the Speaking With Gravity podcast. This is like my second or third season. I don't know. They, they jumbling together. But I'm happy to be with you all once again. Hey, y'all. My name is Santa Williams. I'm a counselor located in Charlotte, North Carolina, and also just a mental health advocate. Yes, uh, Terrence Dawkins. I'm a counseling therapist in Greenville, and Spartanburg, but also licensed in North Carolina as well. Beautiful, beautiful. So, uh, so it's we, May. Yeah, so so it's May. It's uh, mental mental health awareness month. Yep. Uh, definitely want to shout that out. Shout um, out to that yeah. as well as maternal mental health awareness month as well. Yeah, yeah. And so today, y'all, we're uh, we're slated to talk about something really interesting to me. Uh, talking about addressing culture in the context of therapy, um, which is to me so important. It's, it's so important um, when you get into um, when you get into culture itself, right, and just the uh, dynamic thing I think that culture is, the influence that culture has on our thoughts, mm-hmm. right, mm-hmm. On, on, on the way that we operate, on our lives. Um, it also has an influence on mental, on mental health, right? Yes. Yeah. On, on therapy, on, uh, and that's on the side of the person giving therapy, right, and on the side of the person uh, receiving. Uh, just to give a quick example, you know, when I was younger, um, I had some things going on, and I went to, I went to therapy. I went to a therapist. And... Um, and it was an interesting experience. I, I thought it was cool in the fact that I was able to talk out some things, but um, I, I didn't. Uh, I didn't quite think it was cool uh, because of some of the, I guess, uh, possible potential diagnosis <laughs> mm-hmm. that I got uh, and potential uh, prescriptions or remedies that that they were thinking about. And um, and a lot of it, I thought, was just uh, it could have come from a cultural. Could have come from uh, cultural effects, right? Yeah. The effects of my culture, um, of, of being in my culture, and you know, I happened to have a therapist who was uh, who, who was not of my race mm-hmm. um, during that session. So, I, I think that culture can, you know, play into 
uh, those sessions, right? Those, you know, mm-hmm. receiving, getting and receiving uh, uh, therapy, right, in mental yeah. health. So, I mean, but, but what do y'all think? Have y'all had experiences or even, you know, providing therapy, providing counseling, what have those experiences been like for you all? Yeah, I can start off. I have a very similar experience to you. Um, During my childhood, like, I experienced something traumatic, and as a result, um, I was connected with a counselor. The counselor was not of my cultural background, um, not of the same race of me. However, she was a female, so we were able to connect on that um, part of our identity together. But she also went through, like, a similar experience that I had went through. Mm. And even though we connected well through our trauma, I guess you can say, um, and she was very knowledgeable. I was so guarded. I was not mm-hmm. able to just be myself and express who I really was as an individual. Um, I was more so just mission driven. Like, okay, let me attend this counseling session. Um, you know, do what I put in the the work. But I was still guarded, and I was not as vulnerable as I should have been during those sessions. Mm-hmm. And then. Uh, four to ten years later when I'm able to pick my own therapist of course I you know reached out to multiple people within my culture and someone that I could relate to um, when it comes to like you know my racial background my sexual identity my gender and I selected a therapist that was also an African-American woman and I saw the the huge difference Mm -hmm. I was no longer guarded um Naturally, it was just naturally I was able to relate to her on a personal note. Um, and as a result, those counseling sessions were way more effective simply because we were able to connect through our culture. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. Well, for me, for you? I ain't go to therapy when I was a little kid. I'll tell you that now. <laughs> I probably should have, but I did not. <laughs> it's okay. Um, I didn't even go to therapy when I was, well, I'll take that back. I went to therapy in college mm-hmm. for probably like one, two sessions, but that was outside of the counseling center that was on campus. Mm-hmm. Um, and I didn't know, I pretty much went to one or two sessions and that was it. Mainly because I didn't know what to expect, number one. Number two, I wasn't feeling it. And three, I didn't see immediate results. Mm-hmm. So it was like, how do I, I didn't understand the long game. Yeah. But now me now working into a, a college counseling center where I work, I understand the importance of educating um, clients on what therapy is, what therapy looks like, and also getting their perspective of what they're expecting, um, get their perspective on um, maybe some of the bias, not biases, but assumptions they had about therapy mm-hmm. before they came in, and really trying to address those um, in the front end so that I can make them feel safe and mm-hmm. we can connect on that level and, and go from there. But it does play a big role because I think, especially in the African-American culture, we don't look at, oh, let's go talk to someone else, right? Mm-hmm. I think we look to try to solve problems with religion or solve problems inside the household or don't solve them at all and just ignore mm-hmm. them and mm-hmm. keep on going. So, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Hannah, and you said something um, that I thought was really interesting, uh, talking about being guarded and that limiting what you can get out of it, mm-hmm. right? Limiting the effectiveness of it. Um, I thought that was really interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I feel like it really came down to trust. And when I think about culture and how culture influences um, our our group of people as a whole, mm-hmm. culture plays a major factor in um, the music we listen to and the movies we are, the episodes we watch, um, the organizations we attend. And all of this has an impact on our personality, on our coping skills, on um, our su- level of support around us. So I said that to say that, yeah, culture is very important, um, but I think that level of trust comes through working with individuals that I can connect through um, and we have similar cultures to say. Yeah, yeah, it makes you more uh, makes you more comfortable. Yes, right? more comfortable. safe. Yeah, feel more mm-hmm. safe, uh, and that's definitely important. We 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 keep throwing around that word culture. Let's mm-hmm. define culture real quick. Um, for for some of the ones, I mean, we all have a sense of of what culture is. Mm-hmm. Um, myself, I came up with a little definition of culture. I like coming up with my own definitions, y'all. That's yeah. just something about me. That's my how you defi- make things make sense to yourself. Yeah, yeah, make it make sense to me, right? And, and to the uh, to the average person, um, I, I would hope. Uh, but my definition for culture is uh, shared values, norms, beliefs among individuals that allows for communication, validation, representation, and several other tations. 
Um, you got that out of the dictionary. I you? did. I found <laughs> that that so, so Miriam Webster. Nah. W- w- Miriam Webster defines it as the customary beliefs, social forms, and material traits of a racial, religious, or social group. At least that's one definition of of it. Do y'all? I agree. It? What I heard from both of those definitions is um, common experiences, common mm-hmm. values. In order to relate to someone. Um, within a group or within a specific culture, you all have to share something in common. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think, like I was saying earlier, that commonality brings that level of trust Mm -hmm. naturally. Um, And it's up to you to not be guarded, to um, want to participate in counseling or to want to seek help so that you can give more trust and you can gain more trust through that relationship. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I said this before, we as people want to feel connected to mm-hmm. one another or to connected to someone. We do. Right? Yeah. So if I can, I don't have necessarily, and this is my opinion, I don't necessarily have to be a part of your culture mm-hmm. for you, for us to connect. I can understand what you go through or I can show, you know, empathy and concern about your culture and we can then uh, connect that way. Yes. Because now... Um, because you have people that go to therapists that aren't of the same race mm-hmm. or gender and things like that, but they still have a great bond and connection, right? So we just have to figure out how can I connect with this person mm. and truly trying to understand and educate yourself about that culture so that we can form those uh, relationships. So, so I guess it's not necessarily that you have to go with somebody who go to someone mm. who's the same race, right? Who's mm-hmm. the same religious preference or, you know, whatever. Even gender. But yeah. but but going to someone who understands, right, or who's willing to understand your culture, right? What goes mm-hmm. on in your culture and how your culture has been affecting you, right? May even be affecting the reason that you're there, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And the things that you're going through. So that's yeah, that's very important. Mm-hmm. Um I also think um, you know, stepping aside from the cultural difference in you know, going to therapy. But I think there's a cultural difference in access to therapy as well. Mm-hmm. Do y'all feel like, do y'all yes. feel, this, um, yeah. feel that way? Yes. Um, for me, I think, like, access as far as location-wise, you know, mm-hmm. in, like, you know, rural areas or low-income areas, mm-hmm. they might not have uh, access to resources like therapy mm-hmm. or to access to resources of the type of therapist that they're looking for. Right. Mm-hmm. So now that then creates... A, a, a bias a or a barrier, right? And so now if I go to, to a therapist that I only have access to, we don't connect. I now have a belief that therapy isn't going to work. Therapy mm-hmm. isn't for me. Yeah. Based off that one experience and That's that powerful, is yeah. based off of access to it. All right. Wow. Yeah. And what I heard from that is that we have to, if we're seeking therapy, um, we have to have an open mind. You know, if one experience isn't good, there are opportunities and resources resources out there to gain a different type of experience. But what I've seen from my personal experience is that many people get into that mentality, oh, this therapy is not for me. Um, and they stay stuck in that mentality versus being open-minded and trying different sources. So, yeah. And, and I'm curious too, y'all. So, um when people are coming to you, right, um, I, the people that I talk to, right, of, of African descent, I guess you could say, mm-hmm. pe- people that look like me, um, I feel as though there's a misperception about um, about about therapy, right, about uh, what it's for, about what they could possibly or potentially get from it. Um, what have you heard people say? I'm just curious. What have you heard people say in their meetings with you that you would say uh, comes from a misunderstanding Right or a misperception of therapy and what it's there to offer. Well, um, one thing is people think you're just gonna come there and tell and tell you how you feel, or I mean, you ask questions about how you feel. That's not That's necessary not what mm-hmm. therapy is. Honestly, the way I describe therapy to my clients, therapy is a conversation. We okay. have a conversation, and then it's my job to help offer alternative ways of thinking or doing things. Mm-hmm. And it's not necessarily to change you, mm-hmm. right? I'm not trying to fix you either. That's another thing. People, will, especially parents, I ain't going to lie, parents will bring kids to therapy mm-hmm. and be like, fix them. There's there's something wrong with them. And the, the honest the truth is, if you think there's something wrong with them, guess what? They got that from somewhere, so you got some work to do too, mm-hmm. right? So I think... When you educate people about what therapy is and how they came to you, right, mm-hmm. you understand their journey, then that's when you start to 
really start to break down some of those barriers about what people think uh, therapy is and, and try to help break some of those cultural barriers as well. I think one misconception um, within our culture is that they, and just feeding off of what you said, is that our culture sometimes expects therapy to offer advice. So as counselors and therapists, we're not here like you said, to solve your problems. We're here to teach you how to solve your own problems and work you through those problems and offer support and guidance. Um, so many people, you know, just expect therapy to fix everything immediately. And that's well, <laughs> that's not it at all. You know, one, it is, um, it is a long process that you have to put in work, but also we don't offer advice. We don't mm. offer advice. So, yeah. Mm. And the, you, said, you made a good point. I think I said this on a previous episode. People come to therapy sometimes and look for the therapist to fix their problems when my job is to let you know that you're the only person that can fix mm -hmm. your problems and the only person you really need to heal is yourself. A lot of times people come to therapy or look to other people, which is an external factor to fix what's going on or solve mm -hmm. what's going on. But what's going on that needs to be fixed is yourself internally. And the only person that can do that is you. And as a therapist, that's what I try to help you do. And this reminds me of an example that my supervisor told me about. The client is the driver in the car. So if you're thinking about uh, you're going to a location, point A to point B, the client is the driver. Us counselors, we are in the passenger seat just helping you, you know, guiding you through the process, mm -hmm. helping you navigate different tools to use, breathing techniques, um, coping mechanisms. But at the end of the day, in order to get from point A to point B, it's in the responsibility of the driver, which is the client. Now, sometimes we might be in this driver's ed car because y'all remember the driver's ed, some of those old driver's <laughs> ed car had that brake mm -hmm. on that passenger side. Yeah. And sometimes we might have to pump that brake for the client, even though they're driving, and let them know, well, hang on, whoa, whoa, slow down. Let's think about some, this in a different way. Mm -hmm. Now, we're not, we don't have a wheel. We're not controlling the wheel at all, but we might control how much you push on the gas and how when you need to slow down to try to process through things. So I love mm -hmm. that analogy. Yeah, there. thank you for adding to that. Yeah. Yeah. I think there are different types of cultures, right? Within, yeah. within, uh, within society, right? You have, uh, uh, you know, norms and behaviors for work, right? Mm -hmm. so you work can call culture. that like workplace culture, yeah. right? You have, I think, norms and behavior for um, how to be successful, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you might identify that as like hus hustle culture, mm -hmm. right? Um, how do these different cultures, right? Do they do they make it? Difficult, I wonder, for you in in helping people to navigate through uh, their challenges, their mental health challenges, when you take into consideration what society the what society is placing on them, right? The mm -hmm. expectations that society is placing on them. How do you help them navigate through those expectations? Yeah. When I think of when I think of hustle culture, I think of the mentality that we, our generations um, were taught during slavery and how hmm. you just had to work through the pain, you know, whether you were sick, work through it, hustle through it, uh, whether you were pregnant, work through it, hustle through it. So whatever um, element or whatever condition you were dealing with at that time, you just had to hustle through it. Mm -hmm. And I think in our generation today, some of us still have that same hustle mentality that, oh, my mental is not where it needs to be, but I'm going to work through it. Um, my coping mechanisms and how I deal with things is not healthy, but I'm going to just work through it. Um, and that also brings the element of avoidance. So hustle culture is avoiding the elephant in the room and avoiding the conflict that you're experiencing um, to, to feel okay during that time. Beautiful. So I think, I think that hustle culture is unhealthy when you think about really identifying the problem and dealing and managing with the, the conflict at hand. Um, but it brings, it reminds me that African Americans as a group, we're very resilient. We're able to work through our challenges, yeah. but now that we'll advance to a different level in life, we don't always have to. We don't always have to avoid those conflicts and feel like we have to, um, you know, avoid working through Working, we have help is basically what I'm saying. We have that support, so we need to utilize that. Absolutely correct. And you took the words out of my mouth, especially when you talked about host, uh, hustle culture 
uh, back in slavery and how you always had to be doing something to fight through it regardless mm -hmm. of not, then there was some type of consequence for that. Yeah. And so you were trying to survive. In order to survive, I had to continue to work hard and things like that. And that is where I think my when I do work with clients and how I come from a framework of intergenerational trauma that I mentioned before, mm -hmm. of trauma that's passed down, that, that is part of the culture that's passed down. And that culture can be trauma and traumatizing. So I also believe that educating people on exactly what is it about the culture that is benefiting me and what is not benefiting mm -hmm. me. Yes, because sir. I think uh, there's a lot of things within different cultures that does have some type of benefit. Yeah. If it does have a benefit, we'll continue to do it. Mm -hmm. But the moment it starts to hinder us or starts to... Um, you know, put different uh, blockades on our progression, mm -hmm. then that's when we need to slow down and really analyze what about this particular piece of your culture is not benefiting you anymore when it once was benefiting you, even now, if even if that was with ancestors. And you also m mentioned um, workplace culture, and I have a great example of, in my personal life, two completely different scenarios that um, impacted my mental health on a serious note. So all of my life, I was pursuing a career in nursing. And then when I got into college and got into nursing school, a great accomplishment, I was super proud of myself. But as I was working in those clinicals, something just didn't sit right in my soul. Mm -hmm. I was like, you know, this, this hospital is a very rigid and structured setting, which is not bad. You know, um, different workplaces have to conduct differently um, in order to operate. So the hospital is a very rigid and structured setting. It didn't fit well with my personality. My mental health was suffering, and I did not say anything. I didn't seek help. However, I did make a transition, so I changed my major to counseling. And as soon as I started working in the counseling setting, I, honest, I took a breath of fresh air. Like, I'm like, wow, this matches more with my personality. This workplace setting is more relaxed. Um, I'm able to just be my, myself more. And I felt more comfortable in that work setting. So my mental, my quality of life and my mental health was way better. This was a transition that I had to make. Mm -hmm. It was hard because everyone knew, oh, Hannah's going to be a great nurse. Hannah's, you know, she's going to take care of the family when she becomes a nurse. I didn't become a nurse. I became a counselor, and that was something that I had to put my pride aside and say, what do I want out of life? Do I want my mental health to struggle for the rest of my life, or do I want to make a change um, and go to a workplace culture where I feel wanted and, and valued? Well, speaking of workplace culture, do you all get you know, individuals coming to you that that's a burden for them, that's a, either a reason that they're coming right because of what they're experiencing, in the workplace or is part of the problem? Do you all see that in the, in the individuals that are coming to you and how do you help them navigate through that? I think, so you're asking, do people come with like work-related uh, issues or things yeah, like do, that? Do, do you see those, the way that they talk about those workplace issues, do you see those being a part of um, their mental health challenges, yeah. challenges to their mental health? And how does that look sometimes? Well. I th also think, so the way I approach it mm -hmm. is whether it's uh, work situations, whether it's relationship situations, um, I always tell people it's not about what someone else did or it's not about what's going on at work. It's about how did that impact you. How did it impact you? So that has an impact on you for a specific reason. So pretty much that hit a soft spot. Mm -hmm. And that soft spot it was hit because of maybe an unhealed wound from an un, uh, from an earlier experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if my boss came to me and didn't have any type of malintent, uh, and, but they said, "I need you to do better uh, on this particular project. I need you to do it over." Now to you, it could have been like, "Okay, maybe I just need to make some adjustments." Adjustments to me, it could have been like, "Oh, I messed up." Oh, he hates me now. I'm going to get fired. And you start going down this negative spiral. And then, or he's not going to talk to me like that, right? But, again, they mm -hmm. didn't have malintent. That wasn't their intention. But how we interpreted it was, I did something wrong. It's my fault. And that could then remind you of an earlier time or remind your body of an earlier time mm -hmm. because it's not necessarily, <laughs> um, you know, memories that are conscious. It's sometimes memories that are unconscious as well. But that can then remind your body or remind you of an earlier moment where you felt like you didn't do good enough. And then that's why it impacted you so much. Mm -hmm. So what I do as a therapist in, um, in my framework 
I try to help people understand why did this impact you so much and try to heal the underlying wound and not necessarily solve the problem that, mm. that was presented. Yeah, mm-hmm. let's uncover. Yeah, let's uncover. Let's unravel. Let's uncover and see what's there. Right? Exactly, that's causing you to feel that way. Because you can't change your boss. Right. That's one thing you probably ain't gonna be able to change is your boss. You can have all the conversations in the world, but if your boss is gonna want to do something, they're gonna do it. Mm-hmm. But what you can do is work on work on yourself and work, work on the the uh, unhealed wounds that you yeah. have. Yes, sir. So that when your boss does approach you, you don't get uh, as triggered as well yeah. as much, right? So I think I try to help people go from an empowerment standpoint for you to make the changes and not necessarily expect the external force to make mm-hmm. the changes or someone on outside to make the changes. Empowerment. Yeah. Yes. It's about you. And I heard um, just a little feedback off of what you said. What I heard is that it's not... It's not the problem in the room. It's how we respond to the mm-hmm. problem in the room. Um, and like you said, no workplace is perfect. Every workplace has its different challenges. But when I think about workplace culture, it's how you adapt mm. um, to changes within Big. the workplace culture. It's how you cope with the problems that you're experiencing within the workplace culture. Are you going to displace the problems that you're um, experiencing at work in your home? Are you going to bring that anger that um, you're experiencing at work to your home? That is so significant to me. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, definitely. You know, I feel like uh, a lot of the cultures that, we, that we're talking about, whether it's workplace culture, uh, what's another, hustle culture, mm-hmm. even popular culture, definitely mm-hmm. popular culture. I feel like people obey culture, right? Wh- whatever culture says, that's what I'm going to do, right? And I think a lot of times it's because uh, on the other side of not obeying culture is sometimes ridicule, right? Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's persecution. Um, and everybody isn't in a mental state, I feel like, where they can handle that, uh, that, that uh, being different, right? Being, mm-hmm. being an outlier, being, being an outsider. Um, so, so with that, even thinking about popular culture, do y'all feel as though culture can influence like thoughts and actions in people? Uh, a lot, uh, heavily. Let's mm-hmm. <laughs> just put it away. He- heavily. Because mm-hmm. uh, if you think about, uh, let's think about a family unit. Mm-hmm. My mom always told me, family is all that you've got. Mm-hmm. So what she meant by that is you must take care of family no matter what, no matter what they've done or, you know, because we, the only people that we got, we have to look out for each other. Mm-hmm. What did that look like as far as, again, this is family culture. So what mm-hmm. does that look like for me personally moving forward? When mom calls, guess what? I don't care what I'm doing. I'm, I got to go because mm-hmm. she needs me. Mm-hmm. Or um, my sister needs something. My brother needs something. I'm, I'm there, right? Or mm-hmm. someone else in my family. It doesn't matter who it is. I have to be there because family's all that we got. And if mm-hmm. they can't depend on me, then who can they depend on? But then I had to realize that this particular belief or teaching that was taught me in this particular culture Mm -hmm. was starting to have a negative impact on me where I started to stress and overwhelm myself or I'm not reaching some of the things that I want to do because I'm putting others first. Mm -hmm. And then making having that awareness helped me to realize I need to start establishing establishing some boundaries. So I think that when you look at uh, different uh, beliefs or teachings in a particular culture. You have to look at how is it impacting you. And if you need to establish boundaries, do that mm-hmm. without fear of disconnection because that's what you were saying, mm-hmm. ridicule and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Again, we as people, fear of disconnection. we like want to connect. Right. And for me to connect, I must obey. Mm-hmm. But sometimes setting the boundaries doesn't mean there's going to be a disconnection. You're just reframing mm-hmm. how this relationship works. And sometimes I feel like you have to explain that to the person, too. Mm-hmm. Yes. Because pe- people can, especially if you care about that person, right? Mm-hmm. And so what's a way that you can <laughs> that you can explain that to that person, right? Hey, hey, I got I to gotta reframe this boundary a little bit, <laughs> you mm-hmm. know? Yeah. Or, or this relationship, I have to, um, you know, right now I might not have the time that I want to devote to this. Mm-hmm. Um, but I promise you, I'm going to call you back when I get a moment, you know, yeah. or, or, or something like that. What's the way that, being that you're speaking on that? Well, I tell people all the time, like, if you were to come to me and ask me to do something, if mm-hmm. I just said no, that's all I said. I said no. How would you feel in response to that? That's a question. A few different ways. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> no. But what if I said, I cannot do it today, but I can do it tomorrow when I get off work? What's Beautiful. the difference uh, from how you would feel then? I'm not leaving you hanging. You made me feel better. Yeah. You made me mm-hmm. feel better. So yeah, I'll let you know that I can't do it today because I have other things, but I can be there for you mm-hmm. on my time, not your time. But some people still don't understand that because, of course, it's, 
humans. Mm-hmm. We want when we want things, we want it done now. Or if there's some type of inconvenience, we do have some type of you know response to that. But I'm still offering you a solution instead of just leaving you high and dry. And now whether you are receptive of that solution, mm-hmm. that's not on me. That's on you. And you got to some people got to uh, figure out how to manage their own emotions and feelings mm-hmm. when things doesn't go the way they expected. Yeah. And just to add to that, um, I often tell my friends when they come to me about help with setting boundaries with their family, um, where we're talking about like family culture, I, I often tell my friends, do things out of love. Like Terrence was saying, if you're setting a boundary, um, you can be direct, but also have an element of softness to your voice, um, have some type of intention behind saying no, um, some type of reason. So I always tell my friends, do things out of love and see how people respond. If you're so harsh and super direct, most likely the person on the opposite side is not going to respond in a great way. Mm -hmm. But if you do things out of love um, with a pure intention and honesty, then most likely you'll receive a better result. Beautiful. And, you know, before we, uh, we got got a few more minutes, um, I want to talk about black culture just, Mm -hmm. you know, just, uh, just momentarily. Um, I feel like culture is community as well, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And culture is a way of building community, right? Mm -hmm. People, people, uh, people build around community and around culture and different communities go through different things. What communal characteristics would y'all say contribute to mental health challenges in the black community? What cultural, right, and communal characteristics would y'all say contribute to mental health uh, challenges in the black community? Fear. Mm-hmm. Fear? Yep. That's something that we share? Yep, fear. Fear what? I, I'll say um, fear because, again, if we take it back to um, ancestors and you mm-hmm. know, time period of slavery, and this, and this is talking specifically to the black culture, but it's not solely about the black culture because you have other races that also has uh, forms of traumatic experiences, mm-hmm. right, um, that are kind of similar to slavery. But just speaking on the slavery part of it, um, we had fear of consequence of being beaten, of being killed, of being separated mm-hmm. from our families. So we had to, like you said, obey. Mm-hmm. So now mm. I have to obey this particular culture that I'm in in order to feel safe, in order to feel connected. And so now I have, if you fast forward to today, I now have a fear of this connection. I have a fear of being alone. And I have a fear that people will judge me because I go to therapy Mm -hmm. or I don't have an understanding of what therapy is. So I have a fear of even trying to go to therapy. So I think fear plays a lot of into why, you know, some of us experience uh, mental health challenges and, and continue to experience mental health challenges uh, without finding some type of solution. Yeah, I agree. What about poverty? Poverty, too. So um, with poverty, um, we have, you know, in the black culture, I feel like this mindset of, and this is taught, really, this is all that you have. Mm-hmm. This is all that we're going to be able to get, right? So I think... With poverty, in order to get out of poverty, you have to switch your mindset and switch that mindset and and think about how can I get myself out of the situation, even though how hard it might be. Um, You know, I might have to struggle to go back to school. I might have to struggle on jobs that I I don't want to, you know, necessarily have at this particular moment, but Mm -hmm. I have to do it. And I think sometimes we can get limited in what we feel like we're capable of. Mm -hmm. And those are self-limiting beliefs and behaviors. Mm -hmm. But the reality is... Is we have so much potential mm-hmm. that we don't see in ourselves that I think that's what when we start to realize that potential, that's when we can start getting out of poverty. Mm. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I feel like too. Um, this is a great point somebody brought up to me. Um, we're taught at a young age that the only way out is uh, athletics or entertainment, mm-hmm. and maybe we aren't taught that necessarily, but yep. it, it, it's almost like programmed. Mm-hmm. I feel like in, 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 in you know some kind of way it's, it's and then it's reinforced mm-hmm. right um, when we uh, when we see the when we see those that are in those roles in those mm-hmm. positions right mm-hmm. um, glorified a lot yeah. of times yep. and others that are successful right and that are black not being glorified in that way mm-hmm. right um, so do y'all feel as though that aspect of culture can, um, I guess, can limit, like you were saying, limit 
individuals as well and, and, and what they can do? So back, so I'm gonna answer both of your questions together. The value that I thought of, um, he said fear, I thought of freedom. So when we think about poverty, when we think about black culture, we have been taught as a culture that we are limited. Like um, Terrence was saying, this is what you have. Um, so pick sports or entertainment as your way out the hood. However, as society has progressed and as our culture as a whole has progressed, we have freedom to make decisions. Life is all about decisions. So mm-hmm. um, I just want to instill in people that we have that freedom and that flexibility to, flexibility to say, hey, we have access to mental health. Are we going to are we going to pursue it and get, um, you know, get some oper- get some help or get some support? We have the freedom to say, OK, I don't just want to go into sports or I don't want to be a professional athlete or a professional singer in er- entertainment. I have the freedom to make another decision about how I want my life to turn out. And I feel like all of these decisions impact our mental health as a whole. Beautiful. Yeah. And I also think, um, you know, in, in the black culture, we're not really taught how to express our emotions so we don't have language we Mm. don't really have it's important man exactly if i don't have the language to express how i feel guess what it comes out maybe as some other behavior like anger anger, right Mm. or i just become mute or silent Mm -hmm. Uh, so language is very important but we're not taught the language to communicate how we feel so we display how we feel and then with that awareness of how i feel and then if i'm taught the language so awareness and language Mm -hmm. i think i start making connections and building that knowledge to to how I can com- better communicate my feelings and emotions and not only communicate them, but understand where they came from mm-hmm. in the first place. Mm-hmm. So, so I, th- I think great episode, y'all. Do y'all have uh, things y'all want to contribute uh, before, the, before the end of this episode? Anything that's just lingering on your mind? Yeah, I did have one point when you mentioned like pop culture and media and music. I feel like I'm, I'll say I'm appreciative that culture is more accepting of mental health now. So even yeah. on TikTok, you know, we see more mental health videos and more mental health awareness and more people advocating for people that have mental uh, mental health conditions. As we enter a culture that is more accepting of mental health, we also have to advocate. And we also have to be one of those. Um, we have to be one of those participants, I'll mm-hmm. say. So it's obvious that we're all mental health advocates. Um, so I just feel like pop culture is making it easier and more accessible to to gain better mental health. Beautiful. I definitely agree with that. Um, I, as a therapist, I am seeing a lot more, um, you know, people in the black community come to therapy mm-hmm. you're not just you know bringing their children but them actually come um i had a older gentleman approach me for therapy and just said i want to make some changes mm-hmm. and i feel like i want to you know better my life and that shows me that even older generations are seeing the impact that some of the things that they were taught has on them and they're now coming for help mm-hmm. and i was significantly younger than this gentleman but he feels like i have something to offer him so that lets me know that there is starting to become a shift in the way people view mental health, especially in older generations. And I've also I've also seen um, within our culture, I'll say America, period, is that more teenagers and more um, younger people are more concerned about their mental health and also more proactive. So in my work, I've seen parents say, hey, my daughter asked me to come to therapy. I've never been to therapy myself, but this is something she wants. So I'm going to help make it happen. These are teenagers saying, hey, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling different. I'm feeling abnormal. Let me seek some help. Um, so there's a pipeline to that, you know, talking to one's parents and the parents getting help. Um, and I feel like this as cult as our culture, that is very significant and very impactful. Um, and then also some resources. When I was looking into getting a therapist that was culturally competent, um, and I just want to make a disclaimer, you, your therapist or your counselor does not have to be the same race, as you were saying. They don't have to be the same race, the same gender, the same um, relig- relig- religion as you. However, you all have to have those shared values and commonalities for you all to connect um, and build, build that connection and build that, that professional relationship. So I use the website Therapy for Black Girls, and they also have a website Therapy for Black Men, if I'm not mistaken. And you're able to enter your insurance information, the state you live in, um, to seek, to seek you know, different resources and different options for a therapist that might be a good fit for you. Beautiful. Yeah. Can we put that in the, um, I don't know, in the... Uh in the video, in the uh, notes of the video, that'll be great to put in yeah. there. 
And I will also say word of mouth is also a very great um, option. If you're completely lost, go to a professional that's in the field and just ask for help. So I think word of mouth is also another good resource. Yep. Yeah, I, th- I think uh, you brought up a point, uh, too, where you were talking about uh, younger people becoming more aware, right, mm-hmm. and concerned about their mental health. Uh, I think there's a... Um, I think there's a uh, caution there too because uh, you know uh, I I think it uh, opens up the door for someone misdiagnosing themselves. Mm -hmm. So I think that's another reason that um, podcasts like this are important, right? Getting information out there about mental health. Although this, you know, we don't want anybody to you know take what we're saying for their mental health guidance or therapy, but uh, just getting it out there, right? And, And then. Uh, I think it's important for for young people as they're feeling different things before you misdiagnose yourself um, or put put another burden on yourself, uh, right? To to ask questions, um, tell your parents about it, right? Um, so that you can get that uh, get that educated guidance, yeah, right? That professional um, help. That professional help because mm-hmm. there's a lot out there, right? That'll tell you you're this, you're that. A lot out there in popular culture, mm-hmm. right? That'll tell you you're this or that. And then that's falling into the trap that we're already talking about, right? Where culture is kind of uh, running things. So, so you want to get that uh, experienced help, want to get that educated help. Uh, I think it's very important. I, I just thought about that. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, just being aware, right, that everything has an effect on you. Um, everything affects everything. I, I think our, um, I think uh, Curvin uh, used to say that everything affects everything. Um, so I definitely want to shout him out on that. Um, yes. And, uh, you know, communication affects your behavior, right? Mm-hmm. Communication can be from every, it can be from the TV, right? It can be from uh, from uh, what, we're, what we're seeing on social media, be from all over the place. So we want to be uh, careful with uh, the programming that we're getting, you know, and that, that we're allowing our kids to get, um, you know, just thinking about culture. And want to emphasize just because you're from a place where therapy may not be the focus, right, may not be a solution, um, doesn't mean that's where you have to stay, mm-hmm. right? Go get help. Go do what's best for you. Right, so so if you're listening and you're taking in some of this, um, you know, be be responsive to it. If you know you got things, you got challenges in your life, mental health challenges, you know, it, it's nothing wrong with seeking some guidance, seeking some right. help. Um, yeah, sounds good. So again, May is Mental Health Awareness Month as well as Maternal Mental Health Awareness Month. Take care of yourself and Happy Mother's Day to all of the mothers out there as well, including my mom. <laughs> Most definitely. So we are uh, speaking with gravity, y'all. Subscribe. Um, uh, uh, you can find me at at. Well, I have a new what you call it uh, handle or a new <laughs> at now. Something I, like I, that. I, I switched it up a little bit. Um, you can find me at yeah at Joshua underscore be impactful. Uh, where can we find y'all beautiful folks at? Yes, I'm located on Instagram. You can find me at Hannah Elise two underscores. And I'm on Instagram as Terrence underscore Dawkins. Okay, we encourage we encourage y'all to share your thoughts. Right, share your mm-hmm. thoughts. Chat with us. Um, comment uh, in, in the video uh, on the reels. Comment. Let us know how you're feeling, right, and how we can help. Even let us know some topics, right, that, that you're that you're dealing with um, that that we may uh, be able to uh, revolve an episode around. Uh, so until next time, take care of yourself and your take mental care, health. Y'all. Uh, keep pushing forward. Keep moving forward uh, in your mental health path. That's right. See you next See time. Ya. See you next episode.